Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Hello everyone, I'm Salman Razavi. On behalf of Jeff McDonald and myself, we would like to welcome you to the ninth and last uh, seminar of this year's seminar series in breakthroughs in water security research. And we save the best for last. Uh, as always, we'd like to thank Howard Reiter, Canada Excellence Researcher and the Global Institute for Water Security for sponsoring this seminar series. It's indeed a great pleasure to welcome Dara and Takabi to Saskatoon today. Dara is the Bacardi and Stockholm Water Foundation's professor at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He received his PhD from MIT in 1990 and has been on the faculty there since 1991. Dara is an international leader, a really thought leader in Earth remote sensing, climate and water cycle dynamics, and land atmosphere interactions. He's been an, archi uh, an, archi uh, uh, sorry. He's been an architect for several NASA satellite missions for air remote sensing, and is now the science team lead for NASA's SMAP, Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite Mission that was launched in January 2015. This is quite impressive work, and obviously it's going to be uh, what we're going to hear about today. Not surprisingly, Dora has received several awards and honors. To name a few, he's a recipient of the Hydrologic Sciences Award of AGU, American Geophysical Union, and Robert E. Horton Lecture of AMS, American Meteorological Society. He's a fellow of AGU, a fellow of AMS, and quite interestingly, a fellow of IEEE, Institute of Electrical and, e and Electronics Engineers. Well, it's a real pleasure to have Dara here uh, with us today. Dara, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much um, for the invitation to come here and uh, present to you some of the work that we've been doing with SMAP. Thanks for the invitation. We've got uh, back many years with Jeff and a great pleasure to meet someone. I really appreciate the invitation. It took some time to get our schedules together, but finally worked out. I really appreciate it. So um, uh, a few uh, apologies in advance. I'm terrible at uh, graphics on PowerPoints, so you won't see anything <clears throat> that's very polished in terms of presentation uh, material. And also that this is something from the perspective of a satellite mission, which is some 700 kilometers away. So the perspective is definitely not in the details of what goes on in a field, but hopefully it complements it in a way, as, um, as because the measurements are global, albeit from a very far distance. And also, I just don't want to talk about what goes on with the data that's coming down from this mission. I want to take some digression, because I believe it's sort of when we have an in-person, one-on-one, or uh, in-presence discussion, it would it'd be good to sort of take a step back and do stuff that we wouldn't normally do in a classroom. So for the first digression, it's actually a far, uh, not too far digression, it's to sort of look back at uh, my own schooling when I began and what data I had to work with and as a consequence, what I learned and did not learn. And then what the situation is less than a generation away uh, today. So at the beginning of my graduate school days, this was the bread and butter of hydrology, the precipitation input and the stream flow output. And everything in hydrology was in between those two. And this was the beginning when the water hit the ground. This was the end when the water left the outlet. Uh, but Again, in less than a generation, the data looks very different. It comes from, uh, also, uh, additionally, from spaceborne sensors or airborne sensors. And what they measure is different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. In the microwave, in the visible, in the thermal, sometimes they measure gravity. Uh, but mostly they measure radiation in different branches. So it's not the measurement of hydrologic fluxes, but some aspect of the radiation coming off the surface. But they're global. They have uh, refresh rates every two to three days if they're in low Earth orbit. And they have wall-to-wall -wall coverage. So it's very different than these. And hopefully, they complement them. 
So this technological change, um, again, in one generation has been transformative in terms of use of technology. The question we have to ask ourselves is that have they accompanied transformative developments in our understanding of hydrologic processes? Have we made the same leap as technology has made in hydrologic science? And for even a further digression, uh, let's go back to um, a far field, which is uh, psychoanalysis. There was this famous psychoanalysis, Jacques Lacan, who developed the theory of uh, the mirror stage. It said that a child really sees itself as fragments of a body. There's hands, arms, limbs. They don't recognize themselves as a person that connects all three. In fact, they refer to themselves as third person until a stage in their life where they view a mirror, not necessarily a physical mirror, but something that brings them the same experience, where they recognize that these limbs are part of a whole and they're it, and they go from a fra perception of fragments of a body to an idea of a self. And this is called the mirror stage. And the argument is that the geosciences are undergoing a mirror stage. And I'll give you some examples in the sister geosciences. So for instance, this is atmospheric science when I took atmospheric sciences. This is out of my notes uh, when I took the class. At the time, the atmosphere was seen as um, a general circulation which had these dominant zonal flows at the surface which induced these uh, cells, vertical cells in the atmosphere, Hadley feral portal cells. And uh, the uh, picture was this, and you had to learn the sort of various features of this general circulation. But came the mirror stage. We put up the first satellites, and what we recognize now is that the atmosphere is not these steady, zonal, symmetric circulations, but a very turbulent eddy. And since then, we had to have rewrite the entire textbooks because now transport is mostly not through steady flows, but through turbulent eddies. There's eddy transport. So we had to rewrite, in a sense, or re-understand what the atmosphere, uh, how the atmosphere worked and transport stuff. Again, this happened because there was a satellite sitting away, acting like a mirror. The same thing in our sister sciences, the geosciences. This is the oceanography course that I took. And we had, at the time, the thermohaline, again, less than a generation, the thermohaline circulation. We had this conveyor belt that sank in the northern waters in the Atlantic, and then it somehow made it all the way in Pacific, and there was a steady thermohaline flow or the conveyor belt. And then came the satellite altimeters, which showed that the, the ocean is actually nothing like this, but it's a very turbulent fluid. There's a lot of transients in that ocean. We always thought of the oceans as these steady, slow things. And that the ocean life and biogeochemistry is driven by these eddy fluxes near the surface, mixing the nutrient-rich colder waters from just below the surface. And without those small-scale eddy fluxes, uh, you wouldn't have ocean life the way we know it. And that you see these red streaks going back and forth, the El Nino, La Nina phenomena, it became clear that there's this low frequency coupling between the turbulent atmosphere and the turbulent oceans. So Kelvin and uh, Rossby waves going back and forth, creating the El Nino phenomena. So bottom line, our sister sciences, atmosphere and the oceans, have experienced a mirror stage through the availability of global imaging, rather than what you see and can deduce from the surface, uh, because of these spaceborne measurements and global images of their domain, the global domain. The question is, is the same opportunity open to the hydrologic sciences? And uh, I've, I've been criticized for phrasing it this um, sort of uh, without any uh, sugar coating. Do we just sit around and it will happen to us? It will happen for us? Or do we have to do something to get there? We have to put an effort and reimagine and rethink our paradigms to get there. OK, so rethinking paradigms, and paradigms, you can think of it as a model being a particular incarnation of a paradigm. 
it's a, in fact a computer coded version of a paradigm. But it can refer to a basic conceptualization of how states and fluxes link and how things work. How do they, in what sign, affect one another? So let's look at models as the most distilled uh, and encapsulated in code version of our conceptual paradigm. In our history, we've had many, many models that have been introduced, and to this day, they're introduced. Sometimes uh, they are original models, and sometimes they're derivatives. They're just the same thing, slightly different or improved. Nonetheless, there's been a variety uh, of models that have radiated out the same way as species in life, tree of life, radiate out. And there's a process of natural selection. Only a few of them survive and propagate and continue. The rest of them go away. Now, this natural selection is very important because it says only those models that somehow adhere to or are observant or can survive in a particular environment survive. It's not necessarily the true environment, it's just the existing environment at the time. Those models that survive are the ones that can extract as much information as possible from the available inputs. If you have observations and your model or paradigm can't extract the full information out of it, you're bound to be out-selected by another species, another model that can do it. It has to do with parsimony. The model has to be identifiable and observable. So if you have a model that has blind spots of uh, observability or controllability, for people who think of systems terminology, then you're not going to survive because that's an inefficient model. It's not a fit model. And the model has to fit in a bunch of performance matrix and these performance matrix are key in natural selection because only those models that fit this particular uh, perspective uh, or metric will survive. And those metrics are arbitrarily defined by us. So they might not be ideal. So bottom line is that models radiate out, but then get, they get naturally selected and down-selected to a few that meet a few very narrow criteria. For example, the so-called conceptual logic model that we all work with requires precipitation as input and stream flow as output, the first criteria. It actually can achieve that, take input and make it output with great parsimony, only a few parameters, and it can fit the metrical performance that we have defined for it extremely well. It's a very successful enterprise. But what if the available inputs change. What if the basic food changes? And another analogy digression is Darwin's finches. It's about adaptive radiation in evolutionary biology. Darwin had the insight to notice that uh, very close finch uh, variations or va varieties in different islands have different shaped beaks. The beaks were different because in each island, there was a different source of food, plants, insects, seeds, cactus, and other things. So depending on the input, the finches went, underwent a natural selection, and only those that had beaks adaptable to that food source survived. Same thing here. The conceptual model food source is precipitation input and stream for hydrograph. You change its food, you change its input and output, it's not going to necessarily be a very fit species. OK, so that's uh, sort of the premise that the models that we have, and a more general version of it, the conceptual frameworks that we have, are not necessarily the best to extract the most out of the new type of technologies and observational capabilities that we have now, and that if we want to go through a mirror stage like oceanography and meteorology, where they looked at the new data and replaced their understanding of their textbooks or the understanding in their textbooks, conveyor belt to a turbulent ocean, general circulation to a turbulent atmosphere, we have also to somehow rethink at that fundamental level. 
So let me go to the uh, next topic, and hopefully the connection will become clear in a few slides. If we look at the geosciences uh, as a whole, what are the sort of the big challenges out there? But this aside, what is the challenges for the hydrologic branch of the geosciences? So in the geosciences, I think there's very little doubt uh, among uh, the geoscientists that at least these two factors are some of the main drivers of grand challenges. One is that humans are now on par with other uh, Earth phenomena in, as principles of change. The rate at which we're changing the environment is actually faster than any orbital sun or slow tectonic drift changes that have occurred geologically. Short of an asteroid strike, we're the largest, in terms of rate, agents of change. And that much of the physics of the environment is due to heterogeneous processes that don't lend themselves to being captured with simple uh, physics or chemistry, like nucleation, phase changes, surface physics, and other unresolvables. So there'll always be a parameterization in, in models. Now, if you sort of try to translate this into the hydrologic sciences domain, what is of these processes that are most influenced by humans and are the most heterogeneous? And this is a sort of a proposal that within the hydrologic sciences, our challenges are actually these two fluxes, evaporation and recharge. Evaporation links the surface to the atmosphere. Along it is a faint change of water. And recharge links the surface and the subsurface. And along it is fairly large amounts of chemical transfer. Several reasons why these two fluxes are actually the most important uh, that I think there are out there is that, first of all, water is the ultimate scrubbing agent. So these are fluxes that are the first order determinants of the biogeochemical cycles. Carbon, isoprenes, and other um, exchanges of chemicals besides vapor here. Uh, recharge is a great uh, uh, input in the chemical reactor of the subsurface. They link the fast and slow components of the water cycle. Just looking at the time scale of these three reservoirs, there's an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude change between them. And it's the fluxes that link them. The third is what, what I personally find the most interesting, is that these two fluxes, to the first order, determine where the vegetation is, evaporation and recharge discharge. So the pattern of vegetation is a really a map of recharge discharge and evaporation. But to the first order, they determine where the vegetation is. So there's a, to first order, these two influence one another. Also, recharge is unique is that it's a hydrologic flux that is the same number and units in water management than in scientific hydrology. Recharge rate is the sustainable rate of groundwater use. Same units, same definition. And most importantly, these are fluxes that have most dramatically already changed. Not will so do so in the future. But due to land use change, we have changed recharge and evaporation by factors of 2, 3, 4, sometimes 10 in some location. Not 5%, not 2%. We're talking orders, uh, uh, order of magnitude even. So it's a global change that has already happened due to land use change. OK, so time only for one of these. Let's look at evaporation. What do we know about evaporation flux? Well, we know evaporation through measurements at these locations. They're nowhere near enough to be able to map evaporation globally. So I can safely say that even the climatology is unknown, unless you want to rely on a model. But observationally, even the climatology is unknown. And this is an example of one of these flux measurements. They're extremely noisy. Okay. So evaporation is particularly important because it links the 
water, energy, and carbon cycles. Evaporation is water flux, so it's kilograms per meter squared per second of water flux. It's energy flux multiplied by the latent heat of vaporization is watts per meter squared. And when you look at photosynthesis, it can be translated into grams of carbon per meter squared per second. So it's the same flux, essentially, in three different or the three primary uh, cycles of the Earth system. And we have changed it again by land use change and enrichment of the atmospheric carbon dramatically. The question is that if we change the carbon cycle or the energy cycle to any one of these phenomena, how does the water cycle respond? This is not a regional question, this is a global question. How are those three cycles linked? They're linked together like three gears in a, in a watch. If one goes faster, the other one must go either slower or faster, doesn't have a choice, and um, so forth. And there there, there's a closure relationship between them, which is the size of the wheels, basically. The question is that which one, when slowed down, the other one goes faster? Well, in, in this context, it all depends on this curve, which is soil moisture on this side, and evaporation normalized by its energy limited value on this side. How does the soil moisture reduce evaporation? Any farmer could tell you, any gardener could tell you that the shape is like this. It's higher when soil moisture is higher and lower when the soil moisture is lower. But the slope of this curve and whether it goes like this or it goes up like this will determine how tweaking one cycle will change the speed of turning of another gear. To give you an example of how that can happen, let's work with a toy model. Let's have a model of water balance, one equation, precipitation minus evaporation, change in soil moisture, energy balance, energy fluxes minus latent heat of vaporization, and a carbon change, which is assimilation, proportional to evaporation minus respiration. And then all three are linked together to that function I showed you. Again, this is a conceptual model. So let's input a model for that beta that looks like this. So you get soil moisture going up and down with respond to precipitation. This is a get toy model. Temperature goes up when there's long periods of dry down. Plants are happy at the beginning when there's a lot of water and a lot of energy, but then they don't do too well. And the three will vary together. And there's three variables, so we can do a phase diagram, carbon, water, and the coloring temperature. Every time it rains, you become wetter. It cools down the surface, but then the surface warms. It grows in biomass, and then it dies. So there's a cycle associated with it. Now let's take the other extreme, that that beta function is no longer there. Now these three cycles don't affect one another. Anomalies in one doesn't translate to anomalies in another. So the phase diagram looks like this. It's just a ball of uh, noise in space. Now, the world is somewhere in between these two. But the question is, where in between those two? Is the curve like this? Does it hug the axis here and it'll go, or like this? It matters a lot in how these three cycles are phased together. How do we treat this function beta in our models today? Let's look at the US. This is NOAA, the workhorse of the numerical weather prediction. So this is National Weather Service, Air Force Weather Agency, and so forth. And this is CLM, the, no the Climate Model Land Surface Parameterization. That function that links the water, energy, and carbon cycles, the three fundamental cycles of the Earth's metabolism, is one function in the NOAA model with a parameter f, which is two for all of land surface systems. There's something wrong in this picture, okay? If the, the three if the three fundamental cycles are linked this way in tens of thousands of lines, if not hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and not much better in the CLM. So the challenge we put uh, again ourselves is to independently estimate this, independently estimate soil moisture, evaporation, and figure out what this curve should be as a function of vegetation, soil type, season, radiation environment, and so forth. 
So where do we get evaporation? Um, the problem is that uh, with remote sensing, as I mentioned earlier, you only measure radiation in a particular narrow frequency range, be it microwave, thermal, or visible. You don't measure fluxes. So somehow we have to go from this new technology of capability to measure radiation very accurately globally to inferring evaporation without becoming too empirical about it. So again, let's start with a conceptual model. How do we go from radiation measurement in a narrow band to evaporation? So let's look at surface temperature. Again, in a conceptual model, there is definitely a conservation of energy that we can rely on with the heat diffusion equation and conservation. The heat flux is proportional to the temperature gradients in the surface. And the surface boundary condition is radiative fluxes minus heat conduction and evaporation or latent heat flux. All depend on surface temperature, which is the state variable. And the dependencies are, some of them are known, like heat conduction is gradient relationship. There's the clausius clapeyron relationship that comes in here. And the Stefan Boltzmann um, equation, Planck's law in here. So we put all this together as a differential system and do Lyapunov analysis on it. We do a linear stability analysis and do perturbations. We see that the equations for the growth in time of the perturbations, uh, delta S, is proportional to delta S, so there's a linear uh, dissipation. And all these terms are positive, so thank God the system is strictly dissipative. <coughs> you don't have runaway temperatures. So if you perturb the system, it will come back down again. And these are all non-dimensionalized so that the radiative processes are to these radiative resistance ratio to the aerodynamic resistance. Sensible heat flux is the reference one. This is the latent heat flux, which is the closest Clapeyron relationship and that beta, and the ground heat flux. So we have a non-dimensional form of which process dissipates at what rate at a perturbation. And here's the plot of that relative efficiency versus temperature. So sensible heat flux is the reference, non-dimensional one. Everything is in reference to this. Radiation is a very relatively very uh, inefficient process. So if you only depend on radiating away heat, you're not doing too well. And that's why uh, adaptation is not to rely only on radiative cooling. Ground heat flux is not much better, but evaporation is actually, especially at high perturbation, high temperatures, a very efficient way, sometimes two times more efficient than all the other mechanisms. So if we had a way of pulsing the Earth with a heat and looking at how that heat dissipates, we can partition it among these components. That's the sort of conceptual framework. So all we need is like analytic chemistry. You put a, in a, a um, in analytic chemistry lab, you pulse the radiation to a sample and look at the spectral response. Same thing here. So all we need to do is come up with a device that pulse the earth, and then we look at how it goes back to equilibrium. Well, we have that. We have a sun that goes from zero to a thousand watts almost on a regular basis in every 24 hours. It's a very natural analytic instrument where this is the energy source, and we look at how it dissipates. So now we put those together. We have our old equation there. We have now a set of observations of the dissipation of temperature with some errors, multiple satellites. So M is a matrix that projects multiple satellites onto the model space. And then we define our unknowns. Let's define the sum of the turbulent fluxes in a non-dimensional form as one unknown, and the partitioning between them as the second unknown, both of them dimensionless, because we want to use them across scales. We don't want them to be dimensional. So this is the turbulent uh, transfer coefficient under neutral conditions, CH, which appears in both, and this is evaporative fraction. So these are our two unknowns. 
And then the assimilation scheme is that you define a cost function, which is the quadratic of the observations. You want to minimize the misfitable observations. You want to update your evaporative fraction and the uh, um, other parameters. Subject that you have a Lagrange multiplier of the state equation, meaning that you cannot depart from energy balance. You always move on that surface. And you can add weak constraints or not if you want to. And you just m machinery to minimize this. Note, neither precipitation or any vegetation information or soil texture information is used. So here's an example of time series at the flux tower. The um, circles are observations from a flux tower, and the lines are different implementations of this assimilation scheme. Again, all you're doing is inferring evaporation from temperature response, daily temperature response. And you get these periods of dry down that are tracked well. Just, you know, without even knowing what the water coming in is, you can track the evaporation rate due to wetting and drying events. And this turbulent transfer coefficient, you know, when you look at it spatially over this region, longitude, latitude, has the right order of magnitude as you would expect, but it's not based upon a tower, it's sort of based upon the spatial patterns. And there's an east-west pattern here that is evident in the vegetation index, which is not used. So it's somehow picking up the roughness of the surface due to different size vegetation. And then we can put it all together. That evaporative fraction and the observed soil moisture, this was some years ago, so this was done with AMSER E. And for different regions, you have different curves, and we try to link it to soil texture and to vegetation type. And uh, I'm running out of time, so I won't get into that sort of interpretation. But the point is that we have independent measurements now from space of both X and Y. So a few years later, we want to revisit the same thing. We want independent estimates of evaporation. We actually have found an even better way of getting at it. These two fellows um, came up with a very nice paper, a set of papers on how to estimate evaporation from weather stations. So we have that data. And then for soil moisture is this project that I've been involved with, which is the uh, soil moisture active passive. It involved two low frequency microwave. These are the lowest frequencies in both active and passive that had uh, sort of are new to the Earth remote sensing. And there's a handbook which is online and I can send you a, a, a physical copy if you just send me an email. So this was a mission that was specifically optimized for soil moisture measurements and for hydrology. So the measurement tech the instruments and the orbits and the acquisition strategy were all optimized for that. Um, it has two to three day revisit and at an orbit of 60, 680 kilometers. And the objectives were the kind of stuff I've been talking about. What is the evaporation flux at the surface globally? I want a global map of evaporation from instrumental measurements, not models, um, that we can call the climatology in the least. How does it link to the carbon cycle and those beta functions in climate models is a major source of uncertainty. What if that function that links those three together is better defined? Do we have a better temperature, water, carbon coupling? So the launch went extremely well. This is it from um, Southern California, January 31, 2015. It was a really interesting day. The first measurements, this is the radiometer measurements. It measures things in units of Kelvin. It's not physical temperature. It's the equivalent temperature um, um, if a gray body temperature, if um, the emissivity was what it was. So there's measurements of the ocean, except that there are 70 Kelvin. So you don't see it on this chart, but there are measurements of the ocean. This is the radar, so backscatter in dB fraction of what you send and what you receive back times 10. 
and uh, this is the HH pole, this is, um, polarimetric measurements. This is the first, and you can see the data over the ocean when the surface is rough. Unfortunately, after two months, one of those two instruments, the radar stopped working. It, caught, it got caught in a solar storm, it got ionized and stopped working. But the radiometer continues to produce very useful science data. And here's an example of a uh, one year, this is actually only three days, but we have now over one and a half years of global solar moisture retrievals on this scale. Again, it's not at the field scale, but it's global. So it answers some questions and it's incapable of addressing some questions. And again, putting that evaporation together with the SMAP soil moisture, now SMAP here, and this evaporation here, this is, the, for instance, over several stations, the beta curve that we get, and we're slicing and dicing it by looking at it over forest, agriculture, regions, uh, dryness index, and so forth. And just again, this is the beta function that we get out of the independent evaporation and soil moisture. These are the beta functions in CLM and NOAA that I showed earlier. So there is a difference. One last thing I want to get into is other use of the data. This is the data over the Little Washita is an experimental watershed, U.S. Department of Agriculture. So the stars are the retrievals. The blue, that, the light blue lines are the in situ observations. It kind of shows you the comparison with ground measurements. The dynamics are quite similar. This is a good site. They're awful, awful sites. I guarantee you. you know. But the reason I picked this is you'll see in a second. Is the next thing. This is the tau. This is the opacity of the uh, canopy in microwave. So this is how much radiation gets through, how opaque it is. The opacity of the canopy depends on how much water there is in the canopy. What is the water content if I take the tree and blend it down and squeeze it? How much water do I get out, or a crop, or a grass? The reason why I picked this site is that it's agricultural, and if you focus on two major dry downs, this is the kind of stuff you see. You see a dry down after a rain event. This is the tau. You get an increase in tau after the rain stops and the soil dry down begins. This is the happiest time for the plant. There's a lot of water in the ground right after the storm ends, and the clouds go away and the sun is there. So the light limitation is likely to be away. So actually, the water uptake goes from roots to the plants. So this is just looking at dry downs, looking at it at a much macro scale, a dry tropical forest versus one year of data. The black line is the soil moisture time series. In this location is a dry tropical forest. There's a very distinct rainy period and then no rain at all. So the soil moisture goes up during the monsoon season, and then when the rain starts to taper down, it's steadily decreasing during the dry season. But the optical depth, which is the water in the plant, is actually not that impressed during the monsoon season, only modest increase, but once the rains end, the clouds go away, the soil is, um, got plenty of moisture, that's when the biomass growth occurs. That's where the assimilation occurs. And then it just becomes too much and it collapses. And then it starts again. This is the new leaves coming. So this is just one pixel. But so this type of phenology we're, we're looking at. And then, of course, these two data sets are av available, water in the soil, water in the plant, dynamically over time. So now we can look at different biomes. How do they respond to this water-plant relationship in the vegetation-soil continuum? Now, that was the sort of the continuum of the hydrosphere, soil moisture, and biosphere, the vegetation. There's also another branch of the water cycle of the ocean 
which is salinity. This is evaporation minus precipitation and vertical mixing. And the data over the oceans is actually useful to derive salinity in the sea surface, in pr practical salinity units, and the winds, so because the roughness affects the microwave signal. And the two can be put together. So this is the ocean branch of the water cycle, salinity on this scale, and soil moisture over land, obviously, on this scale. And the two are linked because over ocean is E minus P, evaporation minus precipitation. Over land, soil moisture is P minus E, precipitation minus evaporation. So over land, you see the uh, seasons and rainstorms, like the Texas storms and all that. But it's interesting in this particular example to look, focus on the oceans. So for instance, look at the Amazon and the freshwater plume. You know, it's a plume of fresh water that goes out there. You see the monsoon season in um, the subcontinent. The soil becomes very wet, and after a few weeks, you see a plume of fresh water come out. You see the Mediterranean Sea, very high salinity. The Gul Persian Gulf, very high salinity. You see the outflow out of the, um, the uh, tropical rivers of Africa. Anyway, there's a lot of sort of... the a mirror stage, that the water cycle over the oceans and over land are really one and the same thing. And they have to be taught to, of it together. So in summary, um, uh, even though the radar failed and it was tragic and sad, but the L-band radiometry is such high quality and accuracy that it has more than made up uh, the fun you can have with the data. So um, um, we're over it now and really enjoying working with this data. The data is public and available in near real time as fast as it can be shuttled from one location to another, which is less than four hours for the instrument data, less than uh, 24 hours for the uh, soil moisture process data at this website. NSIDC, National Soil and Ice Data Center. Um, each, we have gone over the uh, requirements to document the data. So ground validation reports, data assessment reports are posted with each product. The science use cases are looking at the land and the ocean branch of the water cycle together as one system. Both of them P minus E of some sort. And also looking at plant, uh, looking at water dynamics in the biosphere, hydrosphere continuum. Um, how do water goes from soil to plants in different biomes? And also our um, validation campaigns, besides a few permanent locations here and there, we have uh, 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 under a joint agreement with the Canadian Space Agency and Environment Canada, a um, Canadian SMAP team. There's a parallel team to the US SMAP team in Canada called the Canadian SMAP team. And they are um, focusing on airborne campaigns. So every couple of years, there's an airborne campaign, mostly in Manitoba. And there's a few permanent networks installed uh, for the purposes. So there's airborne campaigns um, under this agreement, um, which has been really fantastic, and, and uh, without it, the project wouldn't be the same. And that the Canadian science team, is, uh, I'll speak for Stefan, I think it's a fairly open system. So here's his email. He doesn't know, but uh, I think that's public information, so he can't blame me. Uh, Stefan's email in uh, Environment Canada, he's in the Meteorological Services. So if I have 10 seconds, uh, I want to go back, not just to SMAP, but the earlier question. So our sister sciences, atmosphere and ocean, have experienced the mirror stage with the availability of this space-borne perspective of their domains from hundreds of kilometers away. It made them rewrite their textbooks, literally, are we there? 
and what does it take to go there? I think we need to change our conceptual frameworks and models are just, again, the incarnation of conceptual frameworks in a programming language. Um, and the way we need to do it is to view the water cycle in its entire life cycle, be it through vegetation or through the oceans. So we can't have our models begin when the rain hit the ground and end when the water leaves the watershed through the outlet. That was for an era where precipitation gauge, which is water hitting the ground, and the stream gauge, water exiting the outlet, was the beginning and end of observations. Those are no longer true, and we can't live uh, uh, with those finch beaks in this era. As a result, the watershed may no longer be a natural control volume for analysis. Okay? No longer ne necessity because these are not your inputs and outputs. And we need to, when you, when you take a satellite and take a picture of the Earth in whatever frequency, it's a picture of the Earth as it is. There's humans there as major agents. There's cities, there's roads, there's urban areas, there's land use change, there's agriculture. And we can't remove humans in order to model nature, because then it's not the thing that's out there. Uh, we can't naturalize the flow, calibrate our model, and then use it for perturbation analysis. And lastly, our models, therefore, have to evolve. We can't just use or adapt models that have precipitation inputs and Q outputs to digest and ingest and digest the new measurements. First of all, we have to solve the water and energy balance simultaneously because now the thermal state of the surface is a major part of the radiation of the surface, and that's what you measure. We have to build models where the states or fluxes are observable by the new technology. And the technical term for that is direct radiance observations. So maybe our measurement shouldn't be precipitation or evaporation. Maybe it should be radiation in 19.7 gigahertz. Why not? That's what we measure. And clearly, we have to uh, have an alliance with ecologists in plant water relationships that goes far beyond what we have today. What we have in our hydrologic models as for ecological processes <coughs> may be good enough in doing input-output for a basin, but it's not good enough to interpret what a satellite sees as an image of the surface, no matter what the frequency range. Because the vegetation is the first thing you see before you see the surface. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dara. Do we have time for questions? Razi, should use the mic, please. I think watch right, is that okay? It's okay. <laughs> Just, uh, you have about 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your interesting presentation. Actually, in contrast to your introduction, it was very nice slides and the PowerPoint are <laughs> really exciting. So my question is, uh, Using your observation, did you uh, see any uh, uh, feedback between vegetation and moist soil moisture? I mean, positive feedback, positive feedback between soil moisture and vegetation. And uh, because in, especially in arid and semi-arid regions, this positive feedback between soil moisture and vegetation and the biostability of the soil moisture can cause uh, a different vegetation pattern and or regime shifts. So my question is, using this, your data, uh, did you observe or can we observe this feedback effects between different components? Yeah, well, um, I'm not sure if it goes the full loop to feedback, but the effect of the soil moisture and most importantly, the timing of when is the maximum water uptake in a plant is 
what we're looking at. So in fact, the retrieval of the vegetation opacity, the water content, is not the baseline project output. It's something that I do with my students on the side. And we have picked two, two case or use cases to demonstrate it. One is through the dry tropical forest, because it's a very clear monsoon season, and then it's just long dry down. And then another case we're looking at it is through um, agricultural regions, and actually looking at agricultural reports to know when the big growths in agriculture were, because the phenology there is so fast. Okay, so, so one of them is duration of a season, so you can detect it seasonally, and one of them is just so fast that you can't miss it. Yeah. Thank you. So we hope. Alain. Could you move to the microphone, please? Thanks. Well, thank you so much for presentation. I've seen that at one side we have the models with a lot of uncertainty and physics and missing physics, and the other side we have the observations of satellites, and we want to merge together. And so, but could we really obtain a just deterministic conclusion from that? Because the one of them seen uh, doesn't really represent a lot of information like whereas radiation, as you said, and observation have limitation like satellites. And uh, combining these two together will not, we will not deter, uh, say that we really we improved, for example, summation of that parameters or summation. For example, the snow. Yeah. Uh, or vegetation or soil moisture. And so we have a lot of techniques to merging together, but I don't know if there is a really how to combine these together to the correct scenario we can use for that. So here's an opportunity in that, um, look, our sister sciences, like atmospheric science, they have these things called reanalyses, okay, where they assimilate whatever data they can get, okay, historically. Balloons, satellites, in situ, and, and they assimilate it into a numerical model. What that, and then they create a gridded data of about 50 years, about hourly or three hourly or whatever. Okay, so the advantage is, is that all this data in all different formats and timing and domains and sensing is now all in one place. The output is gridded so that you can work with it easily and it's constrained by physics so that basic momentum conservation, mass conservation should be respected. As a result, what they give up is this division between models and observations is gone. You no longer have a model, you no longer have an observation. You have a blend of the two. And it's a brave new world, you have to live with that. Okay, and they have done so successfully. And they have this gridded data which is enormous um, benefit to the scientific community is that they can do all sorts of analyses very easily. Okay, without, again, gridded data over 50 years. In hydrology, we're slowly doing that. But let's learn from the meteorologists and learn from their mistakes as well. One thing the meteorologists completely ignored, I can say that completely with confidence, is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. they, culturally, they, they are just not as well adapt at dealing with uncertainty. Um, again, these are pretty sweeping statements, but you know, I'm <laughs> being half a meteorologist, I can say that. Uh, but they're, you know, they were definitely leaders in data assimilation. In hydrology, one thing we know well is uncertainty analysis. Okay, so what if we adopt their um, uh, data simulation experience and vision for the future, but add to it our own strengths? In other words, not to copy them, 
but to take what they have, improve it, and implement it. So have, have reanalysis hydrologic data sets that have uncertainty associated with them. Thank you. Okay, Jeff. Dara, thanks for, thanks for a really uh, inspiring talk. Um, I appreciated your comment about uh, watersheds and maybe we need to rethink about that as our, our uh, control volume. Um, and it, it, it makes me think of two things. One, I should get my watershed hydrology text written quickly uh, <laughs> before, <laughs> before it's obsolete. But second, I guess, as I think about your, your global data sets, um, I'm wondering about the potential to integrate different types of remote sensing products. Like I could imagine if you had trim data for a rainfall product and then you had your SMAP data for looking at the, I don't know, the, 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 the shallow soil moisture and, and then grace for kind of deep, um, you know, storage and release and maybe a river flow product that I, I think is out there or coming online. I'm wondering what you think about uh, the, the ability to uh, integrate different remote sensing products to go after questions that are, you know, analogous to things we're trying at the watershed scale, but now writ large at kind of the global scale. Uh, I think that's what uh, Allah was also um, looking at from a different window, is that can we envision to have a hydrologic reanalysis in a few years? incorporating all the data you mentioned and all the processes you mentioned, graded, consistent, conserving mass, and all that, but make sure that the uncertainty is there as well, because we know how to do that com compared to our sister geosciences. I think it's possible. And, uh, you know, giving up wa uh, watersheds is uh, intentionally provocative. You know, it's just, you know, we have to go back that far. That why do we have watersheds? Because there's no flux boundary. Well, if I'm looking from space, is that matter, or is it more important to have the regions with the same type of forest as the boundary? You see what I mean? And you know, it's it's, it's still, you know, in some place. I guess I guess actually right around here, the. Terrain is that you can have flow directions changing year to year. You know, it's quite possible. So it's not uh, so much banning the use of watersheds as a natural boundary, it's that there may be other boundaries that make equal sense or, um, you know, but this vision of having a hydrologic reanalysis on the same scale as the atmospheric scientists. There's basically two global reanalysis outfits out there for the entire atmospheric science community. One in Europe, one in Ankar. Okay, maybe the one in NASA is one too. Okay, so the entire communities have put their efforts into a few, two to three, centers to do this job for them. And I challenge you to work, uh, to open any American Meteorological Society um, monthly weather review or Journal of Atmospheric Science paper, and if every other one is not using that data set. As a community, they're using one data set, and they have put their efforts in two or three places. So they better get it right, okay? We're at the beginning, we're the ground floor of that. How do we put our heads together to design something that then we don't have to patch later on? Don't do it like Microsoft did. Right? Just a follow-up question uh, on this. So you clearly mentioned the human agent in this system. Uh, I was wondering what's your take on water management, like reservoir operation, water transfer, interbasin water transfer, irrigation. How could they be integrated into this uh, data or large integrated data simulation framework? Um, I, I personally haven't really worked in that area, so I really don't know what information is there. Is there soft information on flows and releases from reservoirs that are, could be incorporated into the mm -hmm. hydrologic family of data? I'm not really sure, but um, there's a lot of small um, 
dams and earth dams out there, and collecting information on all of them might be a, quite a challenge. Right. But definitely this issue of naturalizing flow, to me, is, you know, I just I don't understand it. You know, naturalize something, take the humans out, and then um, do what? You know, it's, uh, we want to see how the system works, not the, how the system works if um, was a fantasy world. You know, it's the real world out there. Okay. Fouad, you go first. Let's make it quick. Thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, I have a specific question. So you showed that how beta function will be affected if we estimate it from uh, the soil moisture observation. And I want to ask you how the observation depth, so you showed that the observation are around 25, 21 centimeter. Does it affect our interpretation of the beta function? Okay. Yeah, so that's one of the uses of the data simulation was to, if you have a diffu advection diffusion equation, which um, could be thought of as the concept of the soil profile in the vertical, and you observe the boundary condition over time, can you solve that differential system? You know, that's the data simulation for inferring subsurface. And we're trying to validate that using in situ observations, and you know, it's challenging, definitely. Um, so that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of situations where you use data simulation to extrapolate your observations from the observable to the inner domain. You know, and that's the whole point of uh, data simulation. Mm -hmm. But Thank you for such a nice talk. So uh, you mentioned climate change. Uh, well, actually, many changes uh, between the past and nowadays at the beginning of your presentation. So um, I was wondering uh, how many changes should be attributed to the kind of technological changes, like you mentioned. How many changes should be attributed to the real, real climate changes, like? those kind of climate change we mention nowadays, is that really climate changes or there's more factors on the measurement changes? Like what kind of race from your, your viewpoint? How do you think this kind of race? Thank you. I mean, the, um, one, um, one difficulty we have in the instrumental record, uh, like precipitation and, um, um, let's say, temperature stations, weather stations, is that the environment that they were placed in has been changing. Cities grow. A lot of them started at airports, so by definition, they're near development. So a big problem in using instrumental records in global change detection is that we don't know how much of it is attributed to buildings and cities growing around the station, and how much of it is natural. And one thing satellites can do is actually give you a unbiased picture of the entire globe without the in situ affecting the instrument measurement. You know, buildings don't affect that instrument that far away. Um, so that's one benefit of satellite measurements is that they're not subject to um, sort of their presence affecting the measurement. Okay, uh, so we are slightly over time, but the, the discussion can continue. We are walking to Alexander's from here and conversation can go on there. So this was our last seminar of this year's seminar series. And we had a terrific line of, uh, uh, of talks, including this one. Jeff, do you have any final comments or anything? Yeah, thanks very much all for coming to the sessions this year. And thanks, Dara, very much thank for you. coming. Thank it you. was a great talk. Thank you.